There shall be one fold and one shepherd. Where it's taken from our Holy Gospel today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we will consider the unity that we desire to have as one fold and how best to nourish it. Now, we struggle with unity, not just because you're human, but, you know, because we're trads. But we struggle with unity. Um, suspicion of those in authority is a tendency that's bred in all of us from the fall. It's a consequence of original sin because Adam and Eve chose to disobey God at the suggestions of the devil. And they began that by suspecting him and his motives, by desiring to raise themselves up higher than their station. We have additional uh, challenges when it comes to pursuing unity, holy unity, because this, uh, this same suspicion of authority is encouraged by our liberal society, whose heroes are rebels who question authority, who reject the status quo, who make up their own rules. And it's further encouraged by our times when there's many churchmen out there who have demonstrated themselves to be hirelings and thieves, not true shepherds. So we have a hard time trusting authorities, don't we? A hard time sometimes seeing unity as a good that ought to be pursued. But our Lord Jesus Christ tells us today that he has come to make us one flock with one shepherd. He does not say, each man may enter by his own gate. He does not say, each may make and follow his own commandments. He does not say, dig deep within you thyself and find thine own well of living water. He does not say, if you wish to be perfect, make a lot of money and pursue your own happiness. Rather, he says, you are to be one as I and the Father are one. I am the door, the only door to heaven. He who does not gather with me scatters. And he demonstrates this time and time again, that he has come to unite the Jews and the Gentiles into the one true faith. Thus, there are two boats, but one great catch of fish in between them. Thus, in today's gospel, there are other sheep not of this fold, which he will bring into the one fold. The time is coming and is now here when all Jews and Gentiles alike shall worship God in spirit and in truth, not just in Jerusalem, but in every Catholic church. So what for us? We, we must make our response twofold. First of all, we must cultivate a real desire for unity. We must recognize that it's a good to be pursued. And then we must employ the means that God gives us to pursue it and to nurture it. We must desire unity. We must extirpate from our souls the idealization, idolization both, of independence, of self-will, of that overweening pride of personal expression. We have a great fitting analogy, analogy, great example of this in our holy Gregorian chant. We look at the different kinds of music there are. Gregorian chant is privileged above every other kind of music because among its other advantages, which are many, Gregorian chant surpasses all the others in unity. As wonderful as polyphony is, Aside from its being more rhythmical and thus applying more to the passions, less to the intellect, it involves multiple voices. Gregorian chant, however, is one voice. It's when many singers are all united in one voice, una voce. Chant 
to be sung well requires both vertical and horizontal unity. The scola must follow one director, one leader. He must set the tempo. He must determine other particular variances that are available in the singing of the one text. He doesn't get to make up his own text, but he has to guide everyone in how are we following this text. And then the members must follow. Doesn't matter how talented any particular singer is. If he does not follow the director, he will introduce disorder. Imagine if, like our American ideal, the liberal ideal, each singer were to be his own director, to sing the music as he thought it was good to him. It would sound horrible. It would be chaos. It would not be beautiful. Each one would be pursuing what he thought was good, and maybe if he was singing by himself, maybe he'd be right. Maybe that would sound great. Maybe it would sound better. Maybe it would sound better. But he'd be destroying unity, and he'd be destroying music. Thus far, vertical unity. Gregorian chant also requires horizontal, what we call horizontal unity. Now, because of original sin again, man is always tempted to go solo, to stand out from the rest. He's tempted to be like the Pharisee who trumpets his own virtue, who raises himself above the others. Now, modern music really emphasizes it's based around the soloist. The one excellent voice takes center stage. And the singer, conforming to this, develops his own particular flourishes and style. And what is worse, he ties it to his image, to his personality. We're at the state where, I don't, I don't know, I don't watch too much sports, I assume it's the same as when I was a child, which was a while ago, that to sing even the national anthem, we think it's best, as a country at least, for each singer to make it original, to make it his own, the absurdity of which, I hope, is obvious. Gregorian chant has a far different goal. The singer, like the priest in the traditional mass, is not called to express himself. Rather, he must humbly subject himself to the music not only that, and not only being obedient to his director, he must strive to blend his voice with the, that of his neighbors. We can sing the same note for the same length of time, but to sing Gregorian chant well, we must do so as best we can so that no voice predominates, that all the voices blend together seamlessly United. This requires humility. The singer must not seek his own self-expression, must not make the chant personal. It is not his own. Rather, he must offer his self, his desire, his pride, his desire to raise himself up. He must offer that as a sacrifice to the sacred music. You might say, well, what about, what about truth? What about truth and justice? Well, yeah, there is no unity without truth. Obviously, we're not saying unity for unity's sake. You know, to do anything successfully, burg burglars have to be unified to a certain degree. And we're not talking about that. But we must remember that just as there is no unity without truth, there is no truth without unity. Unity is thus a sign of truth. All truth is one, and thus the true faith is one faith, not many faiths grouped under one loose conglomeration, one faith. That's why unity is one of the marks of the church. It is one of those means by which even pagans can and ought to see the church as true. Because unity is a marker for truth, because it is something that we all yearn for, Despite our fallen nature, it will always be attractive. 
Suppose there were a hundred missionaries who came to visit a pagan in a foreign land. If ninety of them each preach his own doctrine, the pagan will not listen to any one of them. Rather, he will listen to the ten that preach exactly the same doctrine. Unity has a great attractive power. Unity in tradition, in the one Catholic faith, in their unified expression of the same truths and worship over centuries and across continents. That's why we're here. We have unity of architecture, unity of music, unity of doctrine. All this unity points to the truth. For how could a society guided by sinful men alone survive so long and remain so much the same? Every other society changes with the times and with its members. The church alone has divine unity, and this is profoundly attractive. It points to its nature as coming from God and not from man. People know this. They know that the unity the church expresses must come from God. Their people who are attracted by her unity are then attracted to Christ, the source of that unity. I take great delight speaking to people on the street. I am able to say, come, see the Christian faith, the same Christian faith that the apostles held. See the same expression of the Christian faith, the same music, the same words, the same mass that all Christians, at least in the Western world, have worshiped with for millennia. Come see the one fold and meet the one shepherd. It's a great thing to be able to say. It's a great thing to be able to offer people. The world gives you a new cell phone every other day. Well, not soon enough. God gives us a unified church. And so we have been given a great gift, a unity that we have not assembled, a perfect faith, a perfect teaching, and its most beautiful expression in the traditional Latin Mass and in Gregorian chant. What then is our responsibility? Like with most things, we begin with the truth and move out from there. We must live the unity that we have in reality. Consider the contrary. What will that non-Catholic, or perhaps that one who is foreign to tradition, what will he think if I tell him, come, see the one true faith, see its unified expression, and he comes and sees something different? What if he comes and he sees each man following his own will? What if he comes and hears each singer singing as he pleases, each priest celebrating Mass according to his personality? What if he finds the sheep scattered about, each unwilling to follow, neither willing to be unified from above, nor willing to join in unity with each other. What must we do then? How must we act? First of all, we must submit ourselves to the teachings of the church. We must live in union with those teachings, not in union with the spirit of the world. We must be obedient to our legitimate pastors and shepherds, that is to say, of course, when they do not contradict the unchanging teaching of the church. Then there would be hirelings, thieves. Secondly, we must avoid those seemingly little sins against unity. That is to say, against that horizontal unity that, like the singers in Gregorian chant, we ought to cultivate with each other. Gossip, detraction, Sowing dissent and disagreement, factions and cliques, little sins, little words. But consider those little words that the devil spoke to Eve. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Oh, now, did he say this? Oh, well, let's, let's think about that. Let's question his motives. More than this, complaining being obstinate and unyielding over trivial matters. Are we critical about little and significant things? Do we rankle if there's anything that isn't just how we want it? 
Do we draw big battle lines over things of uncertain import? You know, things about which saints can disagree, about which good priests can disagree. You may say, well, I'm following this, and if you're not with me, you're against me. Yeah. And then on the other side, the happier side, do we work to build unity in our families and in our parish? This is very important. Why? Because liberalism is false. We know it up here, we've got to know it everywhere else. Man is a social animal. And Christ came to gather us into one fold, into one society. Because man needs society. He needs good, healthy, holy society, which is why the state must establish the true Catholic faith as the only legitimate religion. Because only then can man live in peace and harmony. We can't affect that now, but we will one day. Consider the influence that bad friends have on a person. They weaken our resistance to sin. They encourage us to vice. They spread their corruption to us. Good friends have a similar effect, only in a good direction. Holy society. By associating with good Catholics, not perfect Catholics, because they don't exist, but associating with Catholics who are genuinely trying to be good, who try to follow the Church's laws, who try to follow the moral law, even if they fail at times, by associating with these, we strengthen ourselves and we strengthen them. St. Peter himself commands, he commands us, love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Have that horizontal unity. It's not just enough to have vertical unity. That horizontal unity with each other is good to be desired and pursued and worked for. We support each other tremendously by doing good, healthy, holy things together. If you have any doubt, again, consider how hurtful are those sins against unity. How hurtful gossip and slander and detraction are. How damaging backbiting and complaining, picking fights over trivial matters is. How easy it is to find fault with everything and everyone and spread disagreement and dissent everywhere. It's very easy to disrupt a choir, right? It takes communal effort. It takes everyone working together to sing together with one voice. And that's what we're called to. We must demonstrate our vertical unity, our unity with Christ, by our horizontal unity. We must lay down our own preferences. I'm not talking about things that have to do with sin. Our own likes, our own trivial concerns. Just like the singer in the choir has to lay down his own personal style. We must sacrifice ourselves. We must emulate Christ, who when he was reviled did not revile. When he suffered, he threatened not, but delivered himself to him that judged him unjustly. We must love the brotherhood. We must make visible and audible and real the truth that we are one flock with one shepherd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.